While I am usually on the thinner side, I have never been this fit. This is the most fit that I've ever been in my entire life. I'm talking no gut whatsoever. Tapping into your feminine energy means taking control of your life and of course your physical appearance. There's nothing that makes me feel more feminine and sensual than being comfortable in my body. So in today's video, I'm going to be sharing five rituals that I do daily that help me stay slim. If this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Keisha and on this page, I post wellness, beauty, and lifestyle related content. If that is something you're interested in, then make sure you are subscribed and without further ado, let's get started. So let me give you a little bit of background because I think it's important to tell you where I'm starting from. Everyone's body is different and everyone is starting at different points. I'm someone who grew up having a very tumultuous relationship with food and so for a very long time it was very hard for me to gain weight just because I had such a negative connotation when it came with food and maintaining that healthy weight for myself. It ended up becoming the only way that I could really control what was going on in my life and unfortunately I formed a very unhealthy eating habits during that time. I'm so Someone who puts on weight very easily but I'm also someone who sheds the weight really easily as well there was a time when I struggled to really maintain that balance just because of lifestyle so, so by implementing these healthy lifestyle choices I was able to take control of my body and stop this kind of yo-yo weight fluctuation in a way that wasn't like restrictive or limiting myself or giving myself way too many things to do because I am NOT that girl I'm so sorry I need something simple <laughs> I need something straightforward so that I can do it every single day. And so by implementing these little rituals, it completely changed my life. And I really hope that it changes yours as well. So right now I am 29 years old. I am currently sitting at 125 pounds and I'm five foot three. So for my height and my weight, this is the perfect weight for me. And with that being said, I do wanna emphasize the fact that if you are studying the scale, if you're looking at the scale every single day, the number is not really gonna change in the direction that you want it to, because really it's not about the scale. There's so many things that encompass the weight that we're standing at and a lot of it has to do with just the healthy natural weight that our body has. As women, we tend to have more fat in our body and this keeps us balance it keeps our hormones functioning properly and this is really important so it's less about the scale and more about how you feel when you look at yourself in the mirror how you feel when you're wearing certain clothes that make you feel super feminine and wonderful so the first ritual pertains to diet. So the first dietary adjustment was taking an 80-20 approach when it comes to my diet. And this essentially means that I'm eating fairly healthy 80% of the time. So the 20% of the time, I don't have to feel guilty by going out to a restaurant and getting a plate of pasta or by eating you know, a few desserts here and then or having a little bit of a drink or something like that because I know that 80% of the time I've been eating healthy. And so that 20% really won't make a difference. By doing that it allows food to still be fun and enjoyable and of course get rid of all that stress and anxiety that we put on our food by creating restrictive diets so i don't calorie count i don't track my macros i tried at some point in my journey and it was just way too much it was just something that like I got too obsessed about the calorie counting versus actually loving what I was doing with my body and loving the actual food that I was nourishing my body with. So completely got that out of it. I have been cycle syncing for the past three, I think three and a half years at this point. And basically it's eating to support your body during all of the different menstrual phases. I have a whole video where I talk about the menstrual cycle and how to sync to it in order to optimize your health. And I also do have both food and lifestyle charts so you can organize your meals around it at a glance, as well as your life. So your fitness and things that you wanna do on a daily basis in a way that serves your mood and your hormones versus draining and taking away from it. I'll leave a link to those charts in the description so you can get your hands on them. The second thing that I've implemented is something that I've kind of stumbled on by mistake. Like I wasn't really seeking it out, but I ended up just naturally falling to that rhythm. And that is intermittent fasting. There's a lot of opinions everywhere about intermittent fasting, but the way that I approach it, it's once again, not a restrictive thing. You're not restricting your diet. You're not doing anything like that. The studies have shown the amazing effects that fasting has on your body 
by giving your body the allotted time that it needs to not focus on digestion it can actually focus on repairing your body it improves your insulin it reduces inflammation in your body and it can actually help to reduce the risk of developing further diseases down the line i found this post on pinterest that i keep with me because it's really nice to look back at it and see there are different hours of fasting and how they affect your body so i would definitely recommend looking through this and deciding for yourself what you want to do so what i practice is essentially 16 hour fasting once again this is not by restricting anything this is just how my body naturally wants to eat and i found that it's really helped to replenish my body and allow it to heal from the inside out so 16 hour fast is what i typically do on a daily basis and so this means that i would have my last meal before 8 p.m and then i wouldn't eat until 1 p.m the next day so i have a little eight hour window when i'm eating and then 16 hours from that i am fasting now one note that i want to make here when it comes to the research that has been done on intermittent fasting the majority of it has been done on the male uh, body the male physio physiology that's the word there's not as much information on the female body but from what i have learned now this comes from the book in the flow by alicia vt i believe that's her name one of my favorite books on the menstrual cycle and cycle thinking there is a chapter on intermittent fasting and what she does say is that you know our body requires different amounts of food and nutrients during the different phases so a rule of thumb is during the first half of your cycle this is your follicular phase and your ovulation phase you tend to not require as much nutrients so this is a great time to fast and throughout the later end of your cycle this is a time when you want to eat a lot of it more your metabolism is a lot faster during this time so you will be more hungry naturally and so this is the time that you want to eat take without a grain of salt and do your research but it's something that really really helps me Ritual number two is all about hydration. Hydration plays a major role in your health and your overall well being because, well, our bodies are made up of about 80% water. So it only makes sense that by replenishing the water, your body is able to function the way that it's supposed to. I've always said that your skin, your body is designed to heal itself. You just have to create an environment where it can do so effectively. And by giving yourself the necessary hydration, this truly allows your body to flesh out the toxins, to detoxify. It allows all of your cells to function optimally as well, and it helps to maintain a good, healthy weight. Now, when it comes to hydration, it's not just about downing bottles and bottles of water. If you are just replenishing your body with more things that are taking out water from your body, and then you're also um, not fully absorbing the water at all. So there are a few things that you want to do to, in order to get the most out of the water that you're drinking. The first is to get rid of any sugary drinks. So this is pop, this is soda, this is alcoholic drinks, caffeine, sugary drinks in general. Just get rid of those and choose healthier options. Now, this doesn't mean that you can never drink pop or never drink coffee. I love me a good coffee, but only once in a while. And especially eating it in the right phase of your cycle will really help to make sure that you're not doing more harm than good and you don't have to be guilty about having a little bit of that extra flavor. One of the ways that I really love to combat these sugary drinks is by drinking fermented beverages because they're packed with uh, probiotics and a lot of essential nutrients that your body really needs to maintain a healthy microbiome in your gut. So I have a bunch of videos on my Instagram where I show you guys step by step how to make it so go ahead and check that out. Let's move on to ritual number three. This ritual is all about low impact movement. In order to maintain a healthy weight, you gotta get up and moving. However, however, <laughs> I am definitely not a gym girly. Listen, I told you, we are not about rigid routines. We're about flowing with life and making it something that's actually enjoyable and excitable. It's not really about doing the most. It's actually about increasing your heart rate. So get up and moving, get that blood pumping. This aids with circulation in your body. You wanna move around the blood in your body so that all the organs can get access to the oxygen. You want to focus on low impact movement. So this could look like going out for a walk daily. I walk for about 45 minutes with my husband and my dog. We go out every single day and honestly that has truly made the biggest difference. We also go for like hikes and stuff but even just a walk around your neighborhood is enough to raise your heartbeat. Whether it's in the morning or in the evening it doesn't really matter. If you do in the evening it's great for digestion. If you do in the morning it's great to wake you up so it's up to you. The other thing 
I would recommend doing is a mobility practice. This is about flexibility and mobility. I'm a baby millennial and we are projected to live to about 120. At 120, what do I want my life to look like? My goal isn't really to lift weights at 120. My goal is to be able to play with my grandchildren. So if you re-engineer that and work yourself backwards, what does it actually entail? That entails mobility, strength, and of course a bit of flexibility as well so that's kind of what i focus on five to ten minutes of a yoga routine of some body weight exercises things like that hip stretches shoulder rolls all of that to loosen up your body and get yourself moving and get rid of any stiffness in your body uh, the other thing i'd recommend is taking stretch breaks for my entire life i've pretty much worked behind a desk and when you live such a sedentary life as we do it can be incredibly beneficial to just get up for about five Five minutes or so so a rule of thumb would be that if you're working for like let's say 90 minutes take a five minute break get up stretch move get the blood moving it will help you think better it'll help you focus better and it's really really good for your body so just implementing something like that would be great too Fuego en mi alma. Ritual number four is all about stress management and balance. Chronic stress weakens your immune system, it increases inflammation in your body, and it also leaves room for other ailments and situations to take root. So we want to do as much as we can to balance that stress, those cortisol levels, because our body cannot function properly when those cortisol levels are really high. One of the ways that it appears, and at least it appeared for me, was cysts and acne by not managing my stress. So that truly became one of my biggest goals to be able to manage my stress better so that it's not affecting my health. It's really about finding rhythms and techniques that help regulate your nervous system. If you're someone who gets really overwhelmed, this is someone like me, I would say to practice a digital detox. Usually once a month or so, typically during my menstrual phase, I just go away from social media. I don't look at social media, I don't go on it because I find that the notifications, like all of the other things, it's just too much. And during your menstrual phase is a time when you are naturally very reflective and very, you know, sensitive and like open to the world and open to energy and emotions and stuff like that. And so I don't want my emotions to be infiltrated by anything else. The other thing I would say is to time block your day. I'm someone notoriously um, unreachable <laughs> because my phone is always on do not disturb. But more specifically, I have time blocks. I set a focus mode on my iPhone and so that you don't get any notifications or distractions during a particular time. I leave about an hour or two of phone on time just in case people need to call me or you know text messages or notifications or anything like that there's nothing worse than taking a relaxing shower and then hearing your phone interrupt your music that is really annoying we put on our time blocking to prevent that and we can actually truly unwind and be present in whatever you are doing the other thing i would recommend is to practice soul cleansing this is really just giving yourself time to feed your soul and to process what you're feeling. This can look like journaling, which I'm a huge fan of journaling. This has truly changed my life and the way that I emote and deal with my emotions. Um, meditation is a really good way as well. And of course, breathing exercises are super important for calming your nervous system and truly just bringing you back to center, bringing you back to yourself, prioritizing what is important and what is not, or what is in your control and what you don't have control over. Another thing I'll say is to infuse pleasure into your into basically every single activity that you are doing so it can be enjoyable and when you do that you raise your vibrations and you can tap into the frequencies that you're wanting to tap into like abundance this can look like lighting a candle as you do your facial routine setting candles while you do a bath put on some incense um, just whatever it is to make the experience a little bit more sensual and a little bit more fun whenever I'm working or I'm studying I put on some ambient music or I put on some meditation music um, frequency depending on on what I'm doing. Another thing I would recommend is taking a walk in nature. Just being outside, studies do show that literally just being around trees for like 20 minutes is enough to like regulate your nervous system and like give you a full reboot, reset. So try being outside, touch grass, <laughs> essentially. Ritual number five 
productivity and accomplishments. Now I want to be very specific about what I'm saying because I am notoriously the girl who tells you to do less. <laughs> We're not really a hustle culture type of people. We are very soft life, creating that life work balance versus the work life balance, right? But this means that you're finding high vibrational activities that keep you in that productivity mindset. This essentially can look like setting very specific small goals for yourself, accomplishable goals, is that a word? I don't know. That are small, manageable, so that you can get into the habit of feeling that win. That just helps you feel empowered. You know, especially if you're someone who is very used to things not going your way or things really not working out, that's kind of where your subconscious mind is programmed because that's something that you're used to. So if you want to vibrate on a different frequency of productivity and accomplishment, then you want to Put yourself on that frequency actively so that you can be shown new evidence that this can actually work out. So some actionable steps for this is creating a balance between work and play. Play can be very productive because it challenges you and it allows you to think outside of the box. And oftentimes when you step away from a problem, you can gain new inspiration by the other things that you're doing. And I note for myself, when I get some of my best ideas, it's when I'm doing something that absolutely has nothing to do with whatever task at hand. And I'm dealing with. Schedule time to have fun, to be curious, to, to play essentially. You're essentially creating new neurons when you learn new things and you do things that are a little bit challenging but there's little step-by-step -step processes as you do them so there's little wins along the way. The other thing would be to set daily goals. I've talked about this before. When you are giving yourself like an overarching goal it can seem really daunting because thus far most of the goals that you've made, I mean if what January 1st is any indicator, most of them don't really carry on and because you're already primed with that knowing that oh it's not going to work out anyways you're less likely to put your effort into it but if you break that overarching goal into tiny little small goals every single day you're accomplishing something and it's giving you that new confidence to try something a little bit harder this will boost your mood this will also boost your motivation Now the last thing that I want to touch on is something I think is really important to hold space for and that is the impact and the role that genes and hereditary predispositions play on your ability to maintain you know a slim figure whatever that is for you. The first thing I want to say is number one slim looks different for everyone depending on your height your size your you know the healthy weight that you would maintain it, it's different for every single person. I really want to get past the thought process that like if you're born a certain certain way there's nothing you can do about it because that has been proven over time and time again through um, genetic research and even like twin research and things like that. Hereditary predispositions are just that. It's a predisposition. These hereditary factors that you may exhibit is a result of lifestyle and exposure. And so if you change your lifestyle, you change your environment, you change what you're exposed to, you have a lot of power over how your body or your genes express. You have the power to turn your genes on and turn some genes off. Obviously, there are some things that you don't have control over. For example, I have a blood defect called thalassemia that runs in my family. It just means that my red blood cells don't carry as much oxygen as normal people do. And while it is a hereditary thing, there's no cure for it and I can't really change it, there are things in my lifestyle that I can do to mitigate it and to make sure that it doesn't affect my body to the extent that the disease can affect your body. All of this to say is that, of course, there are some things that you don't have control over, but rather than being upset with the things that you cannot control, Control, focus on the things that you can and there's a lot more that you can control than you think. So I really hope that you enjoyed this video and I was able to give you some practical steps and ways that you can implement these rituals in your daily life so that you can also feel beautiful and feminine and flirty and maintain a very healthy weight. Leave a comment down below if you've ever tried any of these rituals. I'd love to hear your experience. Also leave any additional rituals that you think other people can benefit from as well. I would love to hear what you guys are doing. Go ahead and click over here to see some of my previous videos and as always stay gorgeous, stay fabulous, and I'll see you lovely ladies and gents in the next video. Bye!